You are listening to episode 285 of Game Deflators Podcast. My name's John, and I'm joined by Ryan. Hey, everybody. Here at the Game Deflators Podcast, we like to talk about games. We've recently picked up games we're currently playing, and we feel the thunder from down under in this week's Inflation Deflation Challenge. So when you first wrote that, I was like, it's not Australian. It's definitely a knight named Landis. Yeah, I know. But like, it's Lords of the Thunder and a lot of the enemies are on the ground shooting up at us. And we felt that. But if we're to Thunder and they're down. Okay, I see. I see. Okay. All right. We didn't feel <laughs> Thunder from down under, but we are to Thunder shooting down under. Exactly. All right. Uh, so besides the Thunder, this week we are going to be taking a look at a couple things. Hasbro is going to use their DM inspiration to roll an advantage on making a new D&D game. And then after that, we look at the new Warfront for Helldivers 2, where we've gotten confirmation from the front that Sony has attacked Super Earth and destroyed access to 170 countries worth of Helldivers for the war efforts. Yeah, looks like um, patriotism's dead. Tragedy strikes. Yeah, that's about it for those countries. All right, well, of course, you can find us on thegamedeflators.com, our currently out-of-date website. You can find us on social media, at Game Deflators on X, at The Game Deflators on Instagram, Facebook, and Threads. You can also find us on YouTube and the podcast application that you are listening to right now, or maybe you're listening to us on Google Chrome. I don't know, but leave us a five-star review uh, and leave us a comment. We definitely appreciate it. And here's a challenge. You're listening to us on one app. Just go find us on another one and just let us know you found us on that one, too. Yeah. And then leave a five-star review. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. All right. So recent pickups. Uh, I picked up more Magic cards. Imagine Actually, that. Technically, technically, it was not Magic cards that I ordered that were new. It was more so cards that were delayed in shipping. So the seller on TCG, I messaged him on April 19th. I'm like, hey, my cards aren't here yet. You know, what's the deal? You know, it's been a week. And I know I have two weeks technically, but I've received every other order that's come through. So realistically, it should be here by now. And he responds back, oh, the post office in my area is like notoriously slow. Well, the guy was dumb because he completely forgot that um, the post office marks when the letter has been received. And it was on the 23rd that they stamped it, that they received it. So at the very latest, it would have been like, I don't know, the 20th or something or 21st that maybe he got it to the post office and they stamped it. So either way, the dude forgot the order. Like a week afterwards is when he ended up shipping the order. So if I ordered it on the 12th, the guy shipped it out on the 23rd. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, come on, dude. So that's what ended up happening there. And um, I ended up getting those cards like well after I got the refund from TCG. Because I'm like, it was beyond a two-week period. So I was like, I'll put in the order. And then um, he's like, oh, you should have received those cards by now. Let me know when you get them. I'm like, nope not happening now like you straight up lied on like a dollar's worth of cards so yeah you can you can take that loss dude um so i got my cards uh from that and then uh talking about magic uh magic the gathering arena i ended up picking up um a number of cards from thunder junction on there to set up a new deck and then potentially another deck afterwards and the one i'm playing right now is the slick shot show off red deck where you pretty much plot a bunch of cards and hope for a one shot kill on your opponent where you just kind of like unload all of his damage at one time. Cool. Um, so it's actually kind of funny because they have to kind of play in the mindset of keeping like mana open just in case. And you just kind of call their bluff essentially. So you kind of go in for like monastery swift spears and other like smaller red cards to pelt them for little bits of damage here and there. And they have to, at some point, handle that, right? So typically what they'll do is they'll empty out whatever mana to kill those creatures off. Well, in the meantime, you've got a plotted slick shot show-off of, like, prowess plus two plus zero, basically. And um, a couple other cards that are also plotted, so they all get played for free. And so you play the slick shot show-off, and then you play a bunch of plotted cards, and then you play, like, a monster's growth, and then you just poof, bulldoze them for, like, 15 damage in one turn. Dang. It's insane, Yeah. So I've been having some fun with that. And then, of course, the land deck or cave deck that I've been playing for some time. And the deck that, or the cards that you saw a little bit ago here, the uh, Stone Brain uh, set, I'm hoping to actually play. It's uh, a deck where you pretty much deplete the opponent of all of their cards in their deck so they can't play anything but lands. 
Like that's the idea. And it's a budget-based deck. So when they play a card, you put it in the graveyard and you play a card to remove all four copies. Another card hits, remove it. All four copies are gone. You could search through your deck and say, all right, now that I've seen what's in your deck, I can stone brain and remove all four copies of that one card that I know you have in your hand and in your graveyard and in your deck. Mm -hmm. So overall concept is by the time the game is over, they're sitting there and they're like playing lands or cards that are just useless at that point because everything's exiled. So really just a pain in the ass deck to, yeah, to troll. Sounds like it. Yeah. So we'll see how that goes. And then uh, I am playing Tales of Symphonia still. So the update that I have there, um, which, dude, every time I think this game is, you know, like done with its crazy plot story and stuff. plot to us. <laughs> yeah. Like here comes another. Yeah. So I ended up finishing, I think I was at the fight with Asuka, um, like finding the, like finishing up the gods and everything. Um, finished up with all the gods and then ended up going to the Azalea Human Ranch, finished up all of that and got that knocked out. And then now I'm in this area where I'm like in the Ymir Forest and Heimdall, the land, the secret place of the elves. And of course the big plot twist comes in when you're looking for the, um, I think it's like some sort of herb to help Colette, uh, with her angelic ketosis, whatever the hell it's called thing. Um, it gets revealed to you that, uh, what is his name? Idrasiel or Igrasiel, I forget the full name of the, uh, the main bad guy, but that it turns out that he is actually Mythos, the hero. And then Martel was a companion who is this god that you're supposed to be praying to. And then Yuan, the guy that was helping you, and Kratos were all friends thousands of years ago and somehow have gotten to this point in time. And you're just like, what just happened here? <laughs> like, what, what did I just read? That's Mythos the whole time? So that's pretty cool. Like that major plot twist just came up. And uh, luckily through my falling asleep of killing enemies and such, I happened to catch that part of the story and I'm very happy I did. That was mm -hmm. exciting stuff. Uh, and then also I've gotten to the point now with battles. I just have it set to auto. Yeah. Like I'm just so done with battles at this point. So I'm like, have at a game. Go ahead <laughs> and play yourself. for Yeah. Me. You play yourself. The battle will take 30 seconds. I'll play on my phone. Oh, battle's done. Okay. Let's continue on with the story. So that's where I am with that as well. Nice. Um, yeah, so all good stuff. Uh, and then secret game-wise, I did not play any of the secret game this week with my wife. We didn't have a chance to, but you're welcome to still guess. All right, so question for the week. I went back and listened to the questions. Uh, for anybody who was listening last week and remembered, the first question that I asked was, <laughs> is the game longer than 20 hours, to which John said no. So I completely threw my guess out the window last week. When I guess persona. <laughs> Fantastic guess. So my question this week, is this a game that I've played? Yes. For the podcast? That's two questions. Uh, give me that half a question for my garbage guess last week. Nope. You got one question. You asked okay. it. Then I think it's Brave Fencer Musashi. No. Dang. <laughs> I gave you that nice little pause. A little smirk and pause, and it's wrong. I thought that would be a good guess. I looked it up, too. It's only like 14 and a half hours or something. Oh, I see what you did. I see what you did. All right. Well, I mean, you've kind of condensed it down now, right? Only, I don't know, however many games that you have not completed. So this will be great. Oh, so it is a game that I've played and not finished. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. You've played so many different games and finished and not finished. Yeah. So I'm saying you've kind of whittled it down, but at the same time you haven't because you play like four games a week. So it could be, you know, I, I mm -hmm. did go through the list of all the games that you've marked off as been playing. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, is that how you did it? Maybe. Okay. Yeah. So it is a game that is in my history of talking about. So yeah. Brave Fist of Musashi was probably, all my guesses have been in the right vein, but just not the right game. Well, I mean, more than 20 hours wasn't a right yeah, guess. Yeah, that was... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, how about yourself? Uh, so this week, uh, Game Pass, Another Crab's Treasure came out. And a bunch of people had been checking that out. I heard good things. I like a good Souls-like. Uh, and it's really fun, and it's really cute. It's awesome to have, like, a not so 
heavy and you know the same kind of thing like i like to see it being iterated on here the gimmick is really fun so if have you seen anything about this before no i didn't even know it existed so you're like a little hermit crab and you are trying to get your shell back because a lone shark that was like you know those like shark heads on a stick that you like squeeze the thing and they chomp one of those came and confiscated your shell and so you're trying to get your shell back and the gimmick of it is that like you wear different items as shells and that gives you like an ability um and they all have like their own like little stats like how heavy they are so it affects your movement a little bit and then like what kind of um like how much armor they have so there's a whole bunch of different kinds that do different things um and that's kind of your magic the leveling system obviously is not nearly as complex um the weapons is really more just like you have a weapon and then you kind of just like wear some like emblems that kind of modify like your values for your stats and stuff so it's not super deep but it's really fun it's got hard challenging gameplay i would say it's uh pretty platformer centric also so anybody who likes a bit of platforming uh it'll really take those boxes off a bit too and just it's it's nice it's colorful the music's like pretty chill it's very much like gives me kind of like spongebobby kind of vibes and just like being underwater oh, in this a, world it's a 3d platformer yeah yeah it's cool yeah it's really fun um i'm digging that i met like the first like big boss for the game and i just didn't have really time to sit down and really grind that fight out but i really want to check that out a little bit more and then on top of that i've been still playing final fantasy 9 which uh, I am still really liking. I'm getting towards the end of the game. I don't. I guess I haven't really talked about it in a long time, like where I'm at. But basically, I just got the Hildegard three, uh, which is like after you go and res- rescue um, Ico, and Garnet cuts her hair and gets a uh, gets her voice back and. Your whole team's kind of like, all right, we're going to make the final push to go to the Lost Continent, to go to this castle, and we'll, you know, take down Kuja and do, like, the final main fight. So, I just flew over there and landed, and it's pretty cool. The castle's, like, all upside down. Um, I really like this game. I, I definitely talked about it before, but it feels so much more active than a lot of other, like, I don't know, similar kind of games because your equipment is what gives you your abilities. And as you level up, you not only like level up and then your stats go up, but you get ability points, which master these abilities. And then you can assign them to be equipped. So after every like battle or two, somebody masters an ability and you're going in and changing out equipment or, you know, taking a look at their abilities that you have equipped and being okay okay i'm running into a lot of like demons here maybe i should put on like my devil killer ability so that i'm doing more damage and so it's a lot more like kind of menuing and fiddling with your stuff which i feel like with with a lot of rpgs like you really only go to town buy your new weapons and then you don't really do it again until you hit the next town so it's cool to kind of be shuffling things around and I really only done like the main party. I didn't really use like a lot of the secondary characters very often just cause they're like, I don't know, very secondary. A lot of them don't really get much screen time or evolution beyond like when they just kind of come into the story. So, um, hopefully I'll be able to actually finish this one off soon and it'll be like one of the few final fantasies I've actually beaten. <laughs> so from an hour's perspective, like how far are you in the game? Um, you you're gonna pull out the Vita. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you. I think that I'm like, I want to say like 30 hours, but that might be short or long. Uh, usually those games go anywhere from like 45 to 55 hours typically. So you got a little bit to go, but not much. Yeah, I'm I'm also thinking of you know, kind of like the next things that I'm going to play too. And I've been messing around with, like, I played a little bit of, um, 
Metal Gear Solid this week just to kind of mess around with it on my Vita. And that was fun for like 10, 20 minutes. I played a little bit of uh, Shovel Knight, I think I said. Yeah. I really need to buckle down and just do my new game's resolution, which is Bug Fable. But I just need to get it first. <laughs> yeah, I am going to be playing Alundra next. That's definitely the next title for me. Um, okay, so while you look that up, uh, you know, just a quick preview of what we've got going on here in a moment. We're going to be chatting with Jim from Crit HitCon. So they're a convention based out of uh, Mesa, Arizona. And it'll be good to uh, hear from them. So we'll be going to that interview here in just a moment. Did you find it? Uh, I'm loading it up. I, I honestly don't think it's going to really tell me like how long I've been playing now that I think about it. Oh, no. 36 hours and 59 minutes. All right. Not bad. Not yeah. bad. That's quite a bit of gameplay for you. Well, uh, that's what I like about Portable. It's just easier to be able to throw some time at it when I can. Gotcha. Well, let's go ahead and shift over to Jim. Jim, thanks for coming on the podcast, and it's great to have you with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no problem, man. So Jim, as I said, is from Krihikon, and uh, we want to learn a little bit more about this event. So can you tell us about it? Sure, absolutely. So uh, my name is Jim Miller. I am the co-founder and self-described Grand Poobah, because I don't like titles, <laughs> of... Um, that's my official title, actually, is Grand Poobah, of, um, of Crit Hit. Um, we're a tabletop gaming event um, that happens in July in Phoenix, Arizona. I say Phoenix, Arizona, but really it's Mesa. So, um, but you know, most of the time I just have to say Phoenix. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we are, uh, focused, uh, mainly in RPGs and tabletop RPGs. Uh, we also have board gaming and this year we're introducing, um, collectible card games or trading card games, uh, into the mix. And, um, we, happen uh in a hotel which is how a lot of conventions happen but the cool thing about the hotel that we're at now we think this is our new home because it's our second year at this venue um it's it's um the double tree by hilton in mesa and it's a big open atrium which fits perfectly with our model because we've never charged for our vendor hall so we've always had like a you know it's it's a free to shop vendor market and so this year we're expanding that so last year we had 33 vendors this year we're going to have 43 so another 10 so it's going to be a big open market that people can just come and shop vendors and stuff like that and uh gaming entertainment music all kinds of stuff very yeah, nice that's great and it's right up the street for me too <laughs> oh nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah ryan's on that area i used to live in that area no longer out there i'm a little further south now gotcha uh so when were you guys founded and why did you start the event so um we started in 2016 and um it stemmed from i used to uh i used to do some video stuff and i covered a lot of the conventions and i got to know people at conventions and they used to kind of call me at the last minute if somebody would drop out of a panel because i can talk about anything forever because i incessantly <laughs> talk that's a talent um, yeah that's it's just un unmedicated adhd is what that was but um but basically, uh, I got to know people and eventually I started pushing for uh, my own panels and I started doing, um, I fought tooth and nail to get panels about tabletop role-playing games. And they said, no, we've tried that. It's never going to work, blah, blah, blah. But I, but I fought and I eventually got my own panel uh, to talk about uh, indie tabletop RPGs, which is really what my passion is. And so I did that at, at FanFusion, what's now FanFusion, for a couple of years. And people kept asking me that they wanted to play these games. So I said, well, let me try something, some weird, you know, can I do a tabletop gaming convention that's just mostly role-playing games and have it not focused on Dungeons and Dragons? That's like a stupid idea, really, if you think about it. And so like, I was like, well, let me try it anyway. So I did. And, you know, much to my surprise, people showed up and, um, and we, we had a great weekend of playing, um, role-playing games uh, a lot of stuff that i like and and uh you know foolishly i thought well you know if i do a, a convention about indie tabletop role-playing games then i'm going to have players for my indie well it turns out like no that's not how that works i i think i've managed in all the events that we've had to run exactly three games <laughs> in all these years so yeah my plan kind of failed on that front but yeah that's how i started 
So you mentioned to have like a non D and D focus, but given like the increased popularity in D and D in like the last several years, I think Stranger Things kind of really kicked it off for like mm-hmm. the general population. Is that now more of a focus though, or not more um, of a focus, but more integrated into the events than years so, past? Yeah, no. So D and D has always been a part of it. Like you can't deny D and D, right? And uh, yeah. Fifth Edition had literally just come out, so 2016. I think uh, Fifth Edition came out 2015 or something like that. So yeah, early 2015. So, something yeah somewhere around there so yeah no the you know D D has always been there um it's always been about 30 percent of of the games that we run is is D D. um you know and you know currently we're we're working with somebody and looking for other people to really champion that because um i'm not integrated into the D D community per se um uh like i've run fifth edition i used to run it at bookman's every week and stuff like that bookman's and mesa and um and but but that's not really where my passion is and, and i was never really into like adventures league which is the organized play for it so it's you know think of it you know for people who don't know what that is it's basically think of a bowling league where there's like very specific rules for bowling and, and very specific structured things that's sort of like the big D D thing that happens and um that was never my thing and so i i don't think that i've ever been able to um I don't want to try and replicate that without really knowing what I'm doing. So, you know, we're working with somebody to try and help us with that. And and we're also trying to do things like find other people who are passionate about D and D specifically so that we can do it right. So to speak. Right. Oh, so you figured after all these years, like that would happen, but it just, it hasn't. So I'm still, I'm always on the lookout. Yeah. I mean, that's great to have, you know, your, your ideas of what you were looking for but i mean yeah you still got to pay credit to D and have it there and you're trying to make sure that it's done the right way so that everybody could really be excited and and have a really good time um what else is there to really get excited about this event i know you're probably looking forward to mostly those uh indie rpgs but you said this is the first time having tabletop uh like trading card games and stuff yeah we're for sure we're gonna have trading card games um we developed a really good relationship with um uh j and j gaming factory out in glendale and uh they're they're just they're a, a smaller shop out there but like man um you know we had them out at at game on expo and you know they'd approach us you know hey we want to you know we're thinking about doing some tra- you know trading card games and this and that and i was like well i don't know that's not my world but like uh, if you guys can organize it let's let's try it and we'll see what we can do and we gave them the space and we've always had trading card games but never really people um fully own it the way that they did and when they saw how things were going like there was there was a you know a couple of missteps that happened during the convention but they pivoted so quickly and spun it around where they had full tables of people that had no intention of playing like pokemon that weekend and like um and everybody every time i walk by people were having just a great time and laughing and, and just it just seemed so exciting to me and i was like that is super cool and i was like hey would you guys want to do that at crit hit and it's like yeah absolutely and so you know they've graciously agree to to do some trading card games so i'm, I'm excited to see that I'm, i might even there's a game that um people are really into um called uh flesh and blood i think what it is oh yeah i've heard of yeah that. and so i i might even sit down to play some flesh and blood because like it, it seems really compelling to me and i might even despite my uh my calling it the devil's game i might even play uh, some magic because there's like because <laughs> like they started spinning it off into like all these different flavors of magic now right like there's like mm-hmm. a western and and like a warhammer and all that so i might try one of those other flavors like i think there's a fallout so mm-hmm. i'm gonna i might try a fallout magic game which i haven't touched a magic card since 1999 so oh wow yeah <laughs> we were just talking about magic yeah, yeah we were just talking 98. before you hopped on because I, I play almost every week i play magic um but yeah, the Fallout stuff's the commander sets. So like you yeah. can just buy a straight deck and play, you know, good. so you don't yeah. no crazy collecting. Yeah. That's perfect yeah. for me. I want to see so if they've got that one piece card game uh run in there. That's supposed to be really fun these days. Yeah. That's been taking off. So I've been hearing about One Piece for this is my my third year in a row where and it just seems to get bigger and bigger. So I, I think they're gonna do one piece too. Awesome. So with the, is it going to be like tournament style play? Is it just going to be casual kind of come up and learn? Or is it like a mix of the two? It's going to be a mix of the three. So they're going to, they're going to do some um, kind of like learn to play. I know they did that for like flesh and blood and, um, and they did some of that for Pokemon and they'll probably do some actual tournaments. So I think what we're going to do is there's going to be like a, 
I think there's gonna be a pre-release that we're doing and a couple other things, maybe some tournaments that we're gonna run. So hmm. okay. Very we're still cool. hashing out all those details, yeah. So because we gotta we gotta start pushing that. So that's still meetings that we're gonna have uh in this next week or so. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, the con sounds like it's gonna be a really good time, but you know, talking to you a little bit more, you know, for you personally and your connections to gaming, like what are your favorite games? Like video games, board games, uh D D campaigns or or other RPGs? Yeah, so um I, I, I work in tech and, um, you know, I, I make apps and stuff like that. And so most people just kind of assume that I'm really good at video games and play a lot of video games. Cause if you look at me, like I'm a fat old guy with a gray beard and glasses, like that's like, Oh, you love video games. Don't you? Like you love cheeseburgers and video games. Those are two things we know about you. And it's the really cheeseburgers Warhammer. Thing, that's what it yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the cheeseburgers thing is correct. But the, the video games I suck at, I am horrible at video games. But I, I really love retro video games because um, I like games that I don't have to think a lot about. I can just kind of push buttons, pick it up, play it, and then just forget about it. Um, but games that I really am passionate about is is, um, is tabletop role playing games. Like uh, you, you caught a glimpse of part of my of one of my shelves. I have like three of them, um, and because uh, uh, like board games and and tabletop role playing games, and and I think Steam has made it now so. Uh, those of you into video games now feel the pain or, or <laughs> understand, or well, let me put it this way, understand my next statement, which is if you say you're into video games, you're saying into tabletop RPGs, or you're saying into board games, that's not entirely correct. There's cause there's two hobbies, right? There's playing video games or playing tabletop role playing games, playing board games, and there's collecting. <laughs> and <Yeah>. so, <laughs> and those are not the same thing. Like you can buy all the games you want. You will never play them all. Um, but my favorite game system for the last couple of years um, that has been the absolute darling for me is uh, the uh, Year Zero engine, which is a, a it's a rule system that Free League Publishing uses. They put it in almost all of their games. So uh, Mutant Year Zero is is their sort of first uh, game that uses it. That's where the name comes from. But that that same system spills over into the One Ring, which is uh, Lord of the Rings and uh, Blade Runner, the Alien RPG, which is amazing, all use the same system and is by far my favorite system because it's it's simple. Um, it allows a lot of flexibility for role playing. It allows a lot of storytelling through the mechanics, which is unusual. Um, and um, and it's just it's so much fun to play. Yeah, we actually, uh, I had an opportunity to chat with the guys at Free League, and I know the the Lord of the Rings one is 5e compatible, I do know that, but they didn't go into too much detail on the on the other, you know, format yeah. there of rules, so we're planning on having them on in the future, so that might be something to talk about is, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, we had them out at Game on Expo, um, that was like my big get this year was, I was super proud that, you know, we were able to get Free League as a publisher to show up at Game on Expo. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, you, you got to check it out because it, it is it is an amazing system. Yeah, for sure. Um, so going back to the convention, how much are tickets? When and where is the event taking place specifically? Like date, maybe yep. right on the dot hour. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's going to be July 6th and 7th at the Doubletree by Hilton Phoenix Mesa. I really don't like um, hotel names, but that's the name of it. The, the double tree by Hilton Phoenix Mesa, um, which is where the Fiesta mall used to be. If you're local, um, it's basically right across the street off the 60 freeway. Um, uh, tickets are $50 for the weekend. Um, you can buy a, a, I think a day badge for like 25. Um, you can just come in and shop for free. So you don't need a badge for that. So you can, you know, go to the vendor market and there'll be all kinds of vendors there. We're having some really cool ones out this year. Um, along with some other entertainment stuff that happens in there. So it's, it's, we're really trying to make it like a, a fun event to go to, even if you're not playing in the games, but if you're playing games, you, we basically have, you know, our own rooms that we set up throughout the thing. And, um, and yeah, we're always looking for uh, GMs. So if you run games, it'd be at board games or, or RPGs, you can go onto the website, sign up. And if you run one game, then you get a badge uh, for the day. So if you run two games, then you get a badge for the, you know, for the weekend. Um, because we really want our game masters to enjoy the convention, not just work it basically from bell to bell. And, um, and yeah, we still have a couple of vendor slots open too. So always looking for that. Nice. Awesome. So where and um, 
or really where can people learn more oh, outside yeah, of I, yeah yeah so crithitaz.com is our website and on socials on pretty much everything we're at crithitaz so instagram um I, I think we shut down our twitter if if we haven't it's been dead because i just i'm not calling it x and i'm not going to play that game um <laughs> Uh, and then uh, I, I decided, you know, just because uh, I'm contrarian like that, since since TikTok's going away, I'm, I'm trying to focus on putting out TikTok content, you know, before it dies a slow death. So, um, but yeah, we're on we're on all the socials like that. So and Facebook as well, right? Facebook, yeah. So Facebook, yeah, created AZ on Facebook, and uh, we're probably going to have on on the relaunch redo of. Uh, of myspace called no space like i'm looking forward to that one yeah check it out it's crazy somebody somebody made a like a myspace website and they're putting a big push behind it and i'm all about myspace was always the best well now it's no space so it's no space yeah <laughs> I, I look forward to putting stupid gifts on the back of background of my page <laughs> nice weird. yeah that'd be fun yeah and i think there's some other ones we haven't tried out i I don't know. There's like several other social media things that people have been telling us about. And we're just like, eh, I don't know. You don't yeah. know if they're going to take off or not. Right. Yeah. But I know we're on, we're on threads, for example, which is like tied to Facebook and then Instagram. Right. So cool. Well, all good stuff. Um, thanks again for being on the episode. We're really looking forward to the event. We'll have you on, of course, maybe once, twice, I don't know, 10 times before yeah. uh, to talk more. We'll figure <laughs> it out. Uh, yeah. But definitely hope the events is a nat 20 and we're looking forward to it. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. Have a good one. All right. So that was a lot of fun, man. I definitely enjoyed chatting with Jim today and um, getting to learn more about that event. So looking forward to attending it this year. And, um, you know, 43 vendors, I think is what he said for this. So definitely exciting stuff. And uh, I'm sure my wife is going to want to go and get a bunch of D&D dice and other little things and knickknacks that are tied to tabletop gaming. So super exciting. But uh, shifting back into the episode here and, and a similar uh, topic is D&D makers are spending $1 billion on their own video game, promising they'll be the quality and authenticity of Baldur's Gate 3. And this is uh, Matt Jarvis at Rock Paper Shotgun. I, I don't think we've done an, uh, anything with them before, so that's kind of cool. I think we've read some of their articles before. Eh, I don't remember. We've done so many on this podcast, dude. True that. Yeah, easily. Like if you kind of think about it, if we've averaged three over the course of all these episodes, we're nearing about 900 articles mm -hmm. that we've covered. It's kind of insane. Um, I know. Like every, when I wasn't doing the podcast for a while there, it's like, I was just like talking to anybody I could about just like video game stuff. And I was like reading all the news. And I mean, I've never been the kind of person who's like, well, let me just jump in front of my camera and put this on YouTube or something like really doing the podcast or like talking to a couple other of my friends or like my outlet for getting all this info that I get into me back out to other people. So it is always cool to see, you know, what we're each kind of bringing to the table and what we're talking about this week. And I kind of like that we've switched it to kind of like a little bit less so we can kind of maybe look a little bit more at some of these. So what do you got this week on this? Yeah. So uh, this in particular is Hasbro has pretty much said they're committing a billion dollars to, you know, video games and they've got like three games they are going to be creating. One of them is a new IP uh, I'm not going to get into all the deep details because really the discussion I want to have here with you is on the on the trust aspect of Hasbro and, and what they're able to do. We're seeing what they're doing with Magic and how they're like going into all of these different realms of gaming and different worlds of like World of Warcraft and Fallout and uh, God, like uh, they've got the news. I don't know if you saw it, but the stupid like April, May Fool's Day or whatever it was and it had like the SpongeBob lettering, like it was super cringe. They're going anywhere they can to make money at this point, right? So when I see them saying, yeah, we're going to be putting a billion dollars towards video games and it's going to be like Boulder's Gate. It's going to be a great game. And their their thought process, right? And it's kind of noted here in the article is, well, if you make a really good game, then people are going to buy, you know, play it and they're going to buy it. Well, that's the Larian you know, thing that we talked about last week. So it's kind of coincidental that this is the article that came up after the fact. And it's really kind of tying into what you said in that now you're going to have companies out there that say, oh, well, I just got to make a really good game. I don't have to market it. It's going to sell itself because it's a really good game. When realistically, Baldur's Gate 3 was three years in early access. So it already had name recognition and was building up over time. So it's not like it was an 
overnight success that it wasn't marketed and that there wasn't anything tied to it, you already had something there, right? So Hasbro coming in thinking, we're going to create a fantastic game. It's going to be authentic. It's going to be just like Boulder's Gate 3 in terms of quality. And you're going to love it. If you make a good game, people are going to buy it. That's probably the wrong approach. And to me, that makes it seem like Hasbro is going in this with the mindset of we can cut costs as needed to try and put something out into the market and people are going to buy it. Like, I just don't trust it, dude. Like with all the things that happened with the um, whatever, you know, original documentation they had for D&D materials and uh, being able to go third party and selling those products and all that good stuff. The open that, gaming license? Yeah, the open gaming license. I always forget the name of it. So, you know, OGL. That's right. So the whole OGL issue that they had, and now they're just like, you know, the lack of trust that people have already with Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast tied to like the OGL, and now to say, we're going to put out an authentic, high quality game, we're dedicating a billion dollars to doing this. Like, do we really trust that they're going to do the right thing here by gamers and making a great game? Or is it going to be, we're going to go based off of like, the fact that it's D and D and hope it sells well and get something out there. I, I just, I don't know, man, what are your thoughts on Hasbro as a whole and this idea of committing to gaming? Well, so Hasbro has really taken it to us in magic. Like I think everybody who's big in magic can really feel the effects of, you know, how Hasbro has done, you know, big changes to, all kinds of things and pricing like there's no uh msrp on magic there's no um print on or print to order for secret layer anymore you know they celebrated the 30 year anniversary by selling thousand dollar you know boxes of proxy cards that nobody could get use or afford so they really don't seem to care about their core customers as much as they care about being exploitative. So I really don't, I really don't imagine that they're going to be the most ethical publisher out there in a world that they're already willing to cut corners and like make cheap, you know, curly foils and stuff like that's going to, I see that translating very easily to a ton of crunch time on like some mid titles But, I mean, the Hasbro Corporation and CEOs and stuff are going to be real happy to know that, uh, yeah, video game players will buy unworkable junk. We'll complain about it and we'll stop playing it after a little while. But, like, you will definitely just sell games if it says D&D on the box and make some money. And that's kind of just, like, the, the thing that we do, you know? And the thing is, like, Larian's not the first game company to make a D&D video game. I mean, um, what were you playing? Neverwinter? Yeah. Or something? And I mean, that was like a pretty all right game. Like, it wasn't like what Baldur's Gate was. Like, even at the time, I don't think it was like, you know, that polished as like Baldur's Gate is now. But but definitely a different era. I mean, that's like 20 years yeah, ago. Yeah, but I mean, there's a long history of all varying levels of quality for D&D titles. So this is just obviously them trying to say whatever is going to sound best and show that they're going to put a lot of money behind it. But hopefully that it'll get hopefully they have the stick with itness that we don't see. Like one thing we're not really going to talk too much about this week because I didn't put another article in for it. But like Sony just canceled like one hundred and forty million dollars worth of like in development games. It's like. Hopefully, if they're committing a billion dollars to this, that's enough money that they can have a time frame to get something really good going. And I mean, at this point, if they're just going to be starting these programs or, you know, these developments, these are likely going to be next generation console games at this time because they're going to take five or six years to cook if they do it well. Well, when you mention a billion dollars, right, that's tied to this. I don't think it's cash on hand. I think this is more so we're dedicating X amount of dollars. Well, over but a like a time. billion dollars over the course of six years. Yeah. But the point you're making on Sony canceling, right? Like, so Hasbro could theoretically say we're committing a billion dollars over the next 10 years. And so you're looking at a hundred million a year, essentially at that hundred million. Yeah. hundred million a year. I had to do my math all of a sudden. Um, they could go two years in and be like, you know what? 
this isn't working. It's way higher cost than we anticipated. We're not going to move forward with the other 800 million that we were committing towards gaming. We're going through different, you know, endeavors at this point. So, well, then they're not really committing. They're not. Yeah. But that's the thing. It's a public company, right? Yeah. So at the end of the day, they could take that back and say, you know what? We're going through whatever financial hardship as an organization, and this isn't meeting certain expectations. We need to cut costs, whatever it may be. Oh, well, we have this video game division that we're working with right now. They haven't produced a game yet. We've committed $200 million over the last couple of years. Nothing is happening. We're not seeing any major progress. This is going to be still two more years to come in. We've got to put these dollars towards something else and allocate it within the company. We're canceling those projects. So like you can commit up front, but it doesn't mean like it's locked in stone. You're absolutely doing this. So I'd be curious to see, you know, if they actually allow these, you know, you noted here, like allow these developers to cook, right? I just don't know. I, I I really don't. I see it getting canceled at some point. I can see two years from now, we see an article that comes up that says Hasbro closes X studios working on whatever games. Yeah. I mean, the, (laughs) the big thing that I also see being a huge difference here. And I mean, I haven't played Baldur's Gate three, but I don't remember people talking about like microtransactions and stuff like that. But obviously whatever Hasbro is going to do with it, is likely going to be a lot more in that direction. Like I was just reading a thing the other day that um, their D and D beyond or one D and D, whatever their online application thing is like, they're no longer selling like piecemeal content. Like, I guess you just used to be able to go in and be like, Oh, I want to buy this uh, class or I want to buy this magic item from this book. And you could do it for like a couple bucks or whatever, instead of buying the whole book. And then they also got rid of like the book bundles and stuff. So it's just like Hasbro's definitely always a bottom dollar company. And I think that Larian did such a good job with the community and did such a good job with that game and, and how they released it and how they, you know, really were, it was worth everything that you would have paid for that game. And moving forward, the next studios that have to follow that up, are going to have a lot of weight and a lot of big shoes to fill because most of the other D and D games and stuff that I've seen lately are all like clicker games or, you know, mobile games or, you know, nothing really in that kind of upper echelon. So it'll be, it'll really be interesting in hopefully four or five years to see an E3 or a Jeff Keighley show or something. And, get some idea of what's really going to be next for D and D. And I mean, by then we'll probably be out of fifth edition and into whatever is next for D and D as a company anyways. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens then. I mean, I would say the future is bright, but it's Hasbro. So you never know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, it's uh, what do you got going this week? So this week I took a look at Helldivers two has been pulled from steam in 170 countries without PSN access while Valve ignores its own policy to issue refunds for players with over 100 hours. This is by Khan Saren at GamesRadar. So I think I've been pretty public about this to everybody. I want to play Helldivers 2. I want to play it so much, and I can't because I don't have access. So I really feel for all these people because... Well, you have access. You just don't have a PC that can handle it. That's not access. What do you mean it's not access? My PC won't run it, so that isn't access. I can't access it. Yeah, true, but that's... You have a PS5. I have as much access to that as I do Helldivers on my PC at home. What I mean is that it's not like it's inaccessible at all. It's just no, you're not I making... Could, I could pay for like a game streaming service and probably stream it. Yeah, I could do that. Yeah. So anyway... So you have access to it. Shut up, John. <laughs> so, unlike these people... Who no longer have access. So basically when Helldivers 2 came out on PC, there was a sentence somewhere in the FAQ that said, hey, you don't need a PSN account to be able to sign in and play Helldivers 2. So you just need to have it on Steam and you can play the game. So Sony has since change that verbiage and now it is mandatory to have a linked PSN account to be able to play 
Helldivers 2. Now, when this news was first breaking, a lot of people were just kind of like, oh, hey, you know, what what are you whining about? Like, just sign in. I know it's annoying. Make another email. Use a junk email that you used to have. Just do something. Make an account. And you'll be able to play. No biggie. Well, there's 170 countries, and I think it's like 84,000 players that bought this game that their country does not have the ability to make a PSN account. And that makes it uh, just not something they can play anymore. So Steam is able to issue refunds to them and allowing them to get their money back on this. Uh, it's a huge L for them. Uh, you know, Arrowhead is uh, really taking it on the chin for all of Sony's decisions in this case. And they had some bad takes at first, but had since come back and realized the same thing. And I mean, it's a lot of money for Sony to just leave on the table to have, you know, this for no reason. Like, not all 84,000 of those people were spending dollars, but they all spent dollars to buy the game. So, it's just really in their best interest to make that an optional thing or change the user agreement to allow those people to make a PSN network from a, the nearest by country that allows that or something. And there's a lot of people, too, who are probably just going to leave because... Um, one aspect I hadn't really considered, but um, if anybody knows uh, Charlie uh, Moist Critical or Penguin Zero on YouTube, um, he had a take on this. Uh, Sony gets hacked like every couple of years. They're not really the best at keeping your information and data secure. So if you're just not down with Sony being like a shitty steward to your data and information, like... By all means, you could stop playing the game on that account, too. So there's really, like, three big fronts. And this was, like, Sony's biggest thing that they've had going right now, too. Like, we've seen some announcements for some games, but there's just not really that much going for them right now. Like, the PSVR 2 isn't doing anything. They're working on this PS5 Pro that everybody's like, why are you making this? Like, Sony's just so far in the lead that they're just hurting themselves now to give everybody else a break or something i don't know yeah i mean i i don't really have any sort of rebuttal against this right like i think it's a pretty dick move to have a policy in place and then say yeah we're switching that you know that language over so that way it's you know you have to have a playstation network account it doesn't make any sense to me that they would do this when it was optional to begin with um they shouldn't have even sold it to those people in those countries if this is the plan that they were going with moving forward down the road I understand why they did it because they're trying to get all those network accounts in place and get all that data so they can, for marketing purposes and for future sales and things of that nature. And just so they could show their investors numbers. Cause that's the only thing that you're not seeing when you look at that is the investors aren't seeing those people as like PlayStation numbers. Yeah. They're just seeing it as PlayStation network accounts, which means that Sony has access See, there's access again, mm -hmm. has access to all of those different uh, users and that user data. So, you know, data is, you know, from a monetary aspect, data is money for companies, right? It's the ability to market to all of those individuals. And if you have that type of data, then that's fantastic. And investors love that stuff. So, yeah, at the end of the day, um, I think it's a dick move overall. Uh, I do think that Sony will come back and make it optional right long term or not require it for those countries i can't see them honestly leaving millions of dollars on the table because they want to get that information um so yeah we'll see what happens but it is interesting though that steam is like yep yeah, you got over 100 or 100 hours we're still going to refund you like mm -hmm. that's kind of odd um but i guess it makes sense like if a company takes away your access to play the game then yeah steam's 100 percent the right to be like you know what no you're going to give the money back because you're not letting them play it now. Well, and it's such a good move to just do it right out. Cause I mean, what was, um, what was the game that came out that it was like so bad that they like pulled it from sale on like PS five and everything. And people had to like get their money back. Oh, I can't remember what that I don't was. know. The only thing that always comes to mind is uh cyberpunk yeah that's the only game for me yeah that's mind. what it was it was yeah. yeah it was cyberpunk so it's like i think that in today's day and age like 
if if the company just changes their mind on everything, like even if they sold you just an agreement to use the license for an indeterminate amount of time, like at least valve is being like the best of the big companies here, you know? Yeah. I mean, and for valve, this is like huge goodwill too, right? Like this is what valve has done here is taken a negative situation from another company and, and to no real benefit or not any benefit, no detriment to them refunded that money. I mean, yeah, they're technically that 30% that they would normally take that's being refunded as well. But that's less of an L at the end of the day than, you know, Sony. So it's going to cost them several million dollars valve, of course, to be able to do this. And, you know, and that sucks. But at the end of the day, they're showing goodwill. And that's going to mean more players are going to go onto their platform to buy games because of that goodwill and that trust. So I think it's a positive move on valve's part. I think mm -hmm. it's a obviously a negative on Sony's end. And, uh, you know, we'll, of course, see if they turn around and uh, give access back or anything along those lines. But the damage, in my opinion, is already done at this point. Well, and like what happens to Arrowhead where they're just like, OK, we were we were planning out all of this because it's like really give and take with the community and the game director and like how they're taking like the campaign and what their plans are. Like all of a sudden, a huge chunk of their player base is just gone. Well, I mean, it's 84,000 players, and I don't know if the article covered necessarily like how much of those 84,000 players are active users of the game. Yeah, you know, I so, don't know. It, so realistically, it could be like, let's just say the concurrent user base is 250,000 players or something like that. And of those 170 countries, maybe you've only got 20,000 players. So in the grand scheme of things, it's still like a 10% drop in player base of, you know, active users. And this is, of course, me just spitballing numbers, but I don't think it's a huge loss from Sony as far as that is concerned. It's more so the millions of dollars that are now gone mm -hmm. uh, from anybody that maybe wasn't playing, you know. Maybe you had 60-something thousand users that already did what they want to do with the game, and they've moved on. And now, guess what? They're just getting money for nothing at well, this point. And how much does this really hurt Sony, and how much does this hurt Arrowhead? With those 84,000 people, and unless it gets like pretty widespread negative press, uh, it hurts them to an extent, but I don't think it hurts them a ton. It does, you know, reduce trust in those 170 countries, right? Because mm -hmm. those are the countries that are going to be actively uh, talking about that. And that means that people that are potentially buying PlayStation games on PC in those other countries are now going to be like, no, you know, I don't want to mess with Sony because now I'm going to have these requirements and things in place. And that's lost money in the future as well yeah. for those countries. So I would anticipate Sony's going to come back and, and do a right here. But like I said, I think it's too late. So at least for the immediate future. Mm -hmm. We know with things like this, it uh, goodwill or not goodwill, but yeah, I guess, you know, like coming back and, and making things right <clears throat> generally doesn't have like an immediate, it'll have an immediate impact in that regard, but it'll take a little longer for those consumers to be happy again to say, yeah, I trust Sony and I'll go back to them. Mm -hmm. So I think it's uh, it's going to hurt for the short term and then maybe long term it'll it'll kind of fix its way through. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's go into our inflation deflation this week. We played Lords of Thunder on the Turbo Duo or in my case, the uh, TurboGrafx-16 Mini. And this was developed by Red Company, published by Turbo Technologies, which I thought was hilarious that uh, it was Turbo Technologies. It was directed by Tomonori uh, Matsunaga. 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 I couldn't see the A there. Uh, it was released in March of 1993. It is a scrolling shooter with a reception to eight out of or eight to nine out of ten. And uh, the synopsis is, you are a knight named Landis, and you're using your ancestral armor to bring the fight against the evil Derek and his six minions. Yeah. So the, uh, the plot was pretty thin, <laughs> both in game and online. That's, that's about all I was able to cover, but this was, uh, this was a hard game. It was a really good looking game and it was pretty fun and I did enjoy it. it does have difficulty settings. So you could always play it on a lower difficulty and then, you know, work your way up towards getting better. We played on the lower difficulty and it was still difficult. Was that on the lowest? That was on the lowest difficulty. Oh, Your difficulties are normal, hard, and super. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Um, normal it was then. Well, so here's the thing I was reading about this game. And I guess to kind of talk a little bit about it, it's like a heavy metal focused uh, side-scrolling shooter where, like you, like it says, right? You uh, play as this knight named Landis. You have these four elemental armors, wind, 
uh, water, earth, and fire, all of them doing different things. Uh, you have a menu that allows you to buy certain power-ups uh, based on gems you collect in the game and so on. And like your standard shoot 'em up you have, um, or side-scrolling shooter, you have gems that you can collect that'll build up your power on your armor, allowing for different levels of that to be able to do like different types of, of damage. Instead of getting a different gun, you've got to not get hit, kill enough enemies, collect these power-ups, and then eventually your weapons get stronger. Yeah. And so, and then they, they have like 10 different levels or... I don't remember how many, but there's quite a few. It might be eight different levels tied in where you can go in and, and of course, fight. And each of these different levels has, of course, a different type of theme to it and different types of enemies. Like some are shooting from the bottom, some are more side-scrolling, some are all over the place. Uh, and then, of course, uh, after you hit a continue, you can choose to switch your armor based on that level and what might be better. Uh, in fact, if you lost to a boss, maybe that boss, uh, you're able to fight with a different type of armor because it's a different fighting style and using those types of things to your advantage. Uh, with the crystals you can collect, you can get uh, elixirs, you can get continues, you can get power-ups, uh, health back, uh, bombs, different things of that nature to kind of help you progress through. Of course, you don't want to get hit, uh, but with this game, you do get hit pretty easily. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, what I was reading on this game is that, and I went to a few Reddit threads to kind of check it out and see what people were thinking about with the difficulty. The game itself is one of those like get good type of situations. Yeah. It's, it's hard at first, but like we caught it with like the first level I went to, I got to the boss. Right. And then other levels we were like, Holy crap, this is super difficult. Um, with this in particular, a lot of people kind of had the same mindset. It takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of understanding the controls of the game and really the speed of it. So you do have a melee attack, which in most side scrollers, I've never really seen a melee attack. Um, but you have your standard shooting that you can do, and you can actually go up to certain enemies and deal a lot more damage on the melee. Problem is, it, pending speed, you can run into them, right? Because mm -hmm. it's constantly scrolling, along with having things shot at you from different directions. So a lot of folks have said, yeah, it's a decently difficult game, but once you get used to it, it's actually not too bad. And one of the things against the game, in fact, was easier bosses than most games. Uh, I didn't think so in no. what we played. Uh, but also, I'm not exactly very good at side-scrolling shooters. So there's that as well. So what was your perspective overall? Yeah, it was pretty tough. I do like it has, um, you know, the store and trying to, you know, kind of build towards your next run during a run by collecting money and stuff. Like I could definitely see a situation where if you got good enough at a level, you know, like you got all the way to the boss on that first level. Like that seemed probably like one of the easier levels we tried out. So maybe if you got really good with a certain armor and, you know, just on that first level and you were able to by like your second death, have enough money to like on your next try start off with like max armor or something to where you're way more offensively strong and you're going to be just very much more protected moving forward like being able to snowball because once you start to just like get through a level get all that money you know you could probably buy like continues and stuff from there instead of maybe having to buy so much health and just try to just get yourself even to start really effectively. So I think that there's probably a lot of um, benefit to giving this game more of a shot and more of an investment. Um, I have played not a whole lot of side scrolling shmups lately, uh, but it looked really good. You know, the sprites were all nice and visible and the attacks all really stood out. Like it was very clear, like what was happening, which can, you know, usually be kind of a mess having the different, like, armors that you choose instead of just randomly having to like pick up a weapon drop mid fight like you do in a lot of these and you can accidentally like grab the wrong gun or something and then you're like ah like I like kind of avoiding that um yeah uh I I thought it was pretty good um yeah. they did have a port to Sega CD that I was reading about apparently the port is not of good no. uh, of a game uh the game has been well, in the past, ported to the uh, Wii Store, so you did have that, or Wii Shop. And then PlayStation Network had it as part of, like, their Turbo, 16, Turbo Duo 16, you know, setup, mm -hmm. whatever they had on there. Uh, so the game has been ported in, you know, on a few occasions, but this is ultimately, like, the best version is yeah. this one. The, uh, the walkthrough that I was looking at on GameFAQ 
by Apathy Apathy Three Zeros. Uh, it was pretty funny. He was really ragging on the Sega CD version. Oh, nice, nice. So looking at the price here, a complete in box copy. I didn't even know this was. I didn't even look this up beforehand, so I had no idea. Uh, Three hundred and twenty-two dollars and forty-eight cents, and that is its peak right now, um, as of May twenty twenty-four, and it's trending up actually. And a loose copy of this game will run you two hundred two thirty-two. That peaked at two twenty-nine ninety-two in November of twenty twenty-two. That price is holding right now. Um, it's not that much cheaper on Sega either. The Sega one is like 10 bucks cheaper or something. Wow. That's crazy. Uh, I will say though, it is a really cool game. It's got a badass soundtrack. Like you can really get into this game. Is it worth this much money to no. buy a side scrolling shoot 'em up? Absolutely not. I mean, there are so many different side scroll shoot 'em ups out there, uh, that you can play and have a great time with. Yeah. This one is a badass game and I do really like it. But I mean, the TurboGrafx 16 Mini is currently running on Amazon about 350 bucks right now. You could realistically buy one of those for mm, thirty dollars more if you were thinking complete in box, and then have that completely available to yeah. you to play whenever you want, along with tons of other games, including Japanese games. So that would be my advice. If you haven't picked up a TurboGrafx 16 Mini after the episodes we've done in the past, you might want to still pick it up now. It's so, a cool thing. It is a cool console. So. Uh, what do we have on the list for next week? So we've got uh, a few things. So we had originally talked about uh, there's Dinosaurs for Hire, Q-Billion, Super Off-Road Baja, or Ergies. Ergies? I don't know. E-H-R-G-E-I. Oh, Ergies. 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 Damn, dude. You just made me mispronounce Ergies. I don't know what Ergies is. Oh, God, you're killing me, dude. Uh, so, yeah, the next game that we are playing is which one? Uh, I guess Dinosaurs for Hire. All right, Dinosaurs for Hire. That'll be next week. Yeah, so. we're we're trying out a new thing. We're going to let you guys know what we're going to be playing so that we <laughs> have an idea of what we're going to be playing, and so do you. So if you want to, like, book club this and you know, play the game the week that we're going to play the game or let us know what you think about the games before we get to them and, and say, you know, Hey, you guys are really going to hate Ergies when it comes up. Oh my God. You just <laughs> said it again, dude. All right. So either way, like Ryan said, dinosaurs for hires our next game. Then we're going to follow that with Q billion on the game boy, super off-road Baja on the SNES. And then we're going to be doing Ergies on the PS one. So that is our schedule for the next four episodes. Keep an eye on them. And uh, it only took us 285 plus episodes. I say plus because we have some like lost episodes and stuff uh, to get to this point where we were actually scheduling in advance. Hey, we're you learning. Know what? List technology is new and impressive. <laughs> sure, we'll go with that. This has been episode 285 of Game Flares Podcast. My name's John. I'm Ryan, and thanks for listening. <laughs>